Jesus came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But to as many as received him, comma, who believed in his name, comma, he gave power to become the children of God. So you can see what John is doing in John 1, 11, and 12. In putting who believed in his name in apposition with who received him, he's giving us a profound central revelation into the nature of saving faith or saving belief. He's showing us at the heart of saving faith is a receiving grace. Or better, you could say, saving faith is a receiving grace. It's not a giving grace. In believing in Jesus and receiving Jesus, we're not giving God anything. We're not adding to God. Saving faith is the echo of the emptiness of the soul looking away to the all-sufficiency of Christ. And so it is a receiving of Christ, which then leads to this question. Receive him as what? Because the word receive is neutral. It doesn't answer the question, am I receiving him as precious in himself or only as competent? And he might be able to get me something I would love more than him, but I sure want him because he's competent. Or it doesn't answer the question whether I'm receiving him as satisfying in himself or just skillful because he's going to fix my finances or fix my marriage. Or it doesn't answer the question whether I'm going to receive him as a, a treasure or just a ticket out of hell. And I'll put my ticket in my back pocket here and I'll sit on it and ignore it the rest of my life. But, oh, I'm glad I got out of hell. But as far as the rest of the things Jesus stands for, not so interested. If, if that's the way we think about Jesus and faith, we're not coming close to saving faith. So my argument in this book, What is Saving Faith? And the subtitle is just as important. Reflections on Receiving Christ as a Treasure. My argument in this book is that we must receive Christ as a treasure if receiving him as Savior and Lord is real. Or a better way to say it would be, I receive him as a treasured Savior. I receive him as a treasured Lord, treasured friend, I receive him for all that he is, all that God is for me in him. So it's a receiving grace and a receiving of Christ. Now, we all know that we can trust a brain surgeon, the best brain surgeon in the country even if we think he's a jerk, right? He, he abuses his kids. He doesn't care for his wife. He's selfish and mishandles his finances, but he never loses a patient. He's really good. Now, if that's the way we hold to Jesus, he's a great deliverer from the cancer of hell. We don't know what saving faith is. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who found a treasure hidden in a field. And in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. That's saving faith at the root there. I've seen him as a treasure. I embrace him as a treasure. And oh, the difference it makes in all the choices of my life. Paul said, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he puts a name on that surpassing value. He calls it a treasure. This is why I love the treasure language. He said, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Everything Jesus is, all of his offices, all of his words, 
all of his deeds, all of his character, everything is moving toward the glorification of Jesus and the satisfaction of the human soul. And here's what the book intends to get across. God has appointed saving faith as that unique and peculiar act of the soul by which we receive Christ as a treasure and thus glorify him, and by which in receiving him as a treasure, satisfy our own souls. So in one unique divine gift of God called saving faith, God is glorified in us and we are satisfied in him. And what I've tried to do in this book is demonstrate and celebrate that everything I've just said is in the Bible. <laughs> it's not, I'm not winging it here. These are not my ideas. This is God's revelation, and I believe it's a message that the world and the church desperately needs. Mm -hmm. 